Cars are cool. History is cool. Car history is really cool, but rarely aligns with the geopolitical edge I've tried to maintain in the past. The Jeep, though, this breaks this trend, thus giving me an excuse to talk about it without substantial repercussions from viewers like you. For anybody that doesn't know, Jeeps were not originally the civilian-based product of today, but instead a military reconnaissance vehicle. Intrigue, I know. Let's get started. So it's the year 1940. Europe and Asia, they're under some stress, and the good old USA fears future confrontation. With this in mind, the U.S. Army asks over 100 manufacturers to submit concepts for a lightweight four-wheel drive reconnaissance vehicle. It's a tall order. The weight desired is well under the average consumer vehicle of the day. Most manufacturers were focusing their efforts on large six- or eight-cylinder engines and massive cars, and because of that, only two actually submit ideas. This would be Willys Overland and the Bantam Car Company. Bantam's poor financial situation led to its focus on cheaper and lighter four-cylinder vehicles, making it a good fit as a contractor. Regardless, Bantam won the Army contract. Trouble was, Bantam wasn't big enough to meet the Army's demands. With that, the Army reached out to another manufacturer who submitted their own design, Willys Overland. Oh, and Ford. You see, Willys and Ford agreed to help supply the Army's demand for reconnaissance vehicles, but they didn't stop there. They both made some contributions to Bantam's original vehicle final design. Willys added a stronger engine with more torque, and is it truly a Jeep without that torque? And Ford contributed to the now iconic slotted grille with round headlights. So at this point, the three manufacturers had their own versions, but war broke out. Willys and Ford shipped their respective versions overseas. It would be the greatest conflict in human history. But today, I'm just talking about the Jeeps. They were nimble, even off-road, versatile in troop transport and supply drops. The hoods could even be used as picnic tables. Troops fell in love, and when the war ended, some began to ask, when can I get one? Well, by this point, only one company was still actually producing the vehicle. As we said, Bantam wasn't that big, and Ford kinda just quit. So it was up to Willys to meet consumer demand. All American car production had stopped during the war, so this would be part of this new wave of post-war cars. But what about a name? Notice we haven't said Jeep a whole lot in this Jeep-based episode, and that's because the origins are kind of complicated. But here is some basics. So during World War I, any prototype vehicle that wasn't yet tested was simply referred to as a Jeep. That's one start. What seems to be very likely connected was the fact of the designation for the Ford Pygmy was GPW, G for government, P for its wheelbase length, and W for Willie's engine. Shortened sometimes to GP, this could easily be slurred into Jeep. So back to Willie's. They filed a trademark, they start selling Jeeps called the CJ, which stands for Civilian Jeep. Troops bought them, and so did everybody else. They were used for Everything from farming, mail delivery, and beach resort transport. So, after this point in the story, in my opinion, it still remains intriguing, however distant from the aforementioned content demanded by, quote, viewers like you, end quote, so I'll be quick about it. Company called Kaiser buys Willy. Company called AMC buys Kaiser. Company called Chrysler buys AMC. Company called Daimler buys Chrysler. And company called Fiat buys Chrysler. So now, yes, Fiat owns Jeep. Regardless who owns it, Jeep always has been distinct from its parent companies. From its origin, its look, versatility, and occasional lack of doors, it remains an important footnote in American history. This is Tyler of Knowledge Hub. I should probably go.